holster, a loose blanket over the handle protects the baby from the cold. The cradle board can even be tipped forward until the handle rests on the ground for ready burping of the infant. The chief advantage of swaddling lies in the ease of handling and transport of infants in a nomadic society, keeping them out of harm's reach and out of trouble while protected from the cold. These are happy babies. This demonstrates the practice of swaddling. The legs are bound tightly together. The child cannot flex his thighs. Abduction and external rotation of the leg are impossible. Note that diapers are now used, though until 10 years ago, moss was used. If an Indian child grows up bow-legged or knock-kneed, the other Indian ladies tell the mother that she did not hold the leg straight enough. Note the deft, rapid movements of the mother in doing up the Tikkanogan. All mothers use a very similar technique. In most areas of Saskatchewan, the Tikkanogan itself has already passed out of use. However, it persists in almost universal use on the Red Earth Reserve where these movies were taken. The arms are incorporated, but sometimes the older children may have their arms out. It is of some interest that the high incidence of CDH in other parts of the world is also among those people where swaddling is a common practice. All Indian babies wear a bonnet. Here is a smaller infant in a very colorful Tikkanogan. As mentioned, swaddling and CDH occur together among the laps of northern Sweden and Norway in northern Italy and in the mountains of southern Germany and among the Navajo and Apache Indians of Arizona, all of whom swaddle their infants. It is somewhat paradoxical that at Red Earth, where the Tikkanogan is used more than on any other Saskatchewan reserve today, there is only one case of CDH among 600 people. The genetic predisposition seems lacking at Red Earth. This confirms that there are multiple factors in the etiology of CDH and suggests that the environmental causes, though important, are secondary and operative only in those cases that have the genetic predisposition. The inbreeding that occurs in isolated Indian communities aggravates the problem. The swaddled infant is pacified, cries less, and sleeps more. The average cardiac and respiratory rates are lower. The tribes who use this method say that it keeps the limbs straight, keeps the infant's hands and feet out of its mouth, prevents play with genitals, and even obviates rough handling of the mother's breasts. The cradle board is prepared after, not before, the birth of a first child. If a second infant is born while its older sibling still requires a cradle board, the mother borrows a second one for a while. When an infant dies, protocol demands that a neighbor offer to take the cradle board. The parents later buy a new one for the next child when it is born. Infants are taken out of the cradle board for about 20 minutes twice a day. Another method of swaddling an Indian child is in a moss bag or wasp bassoon. The moss bag is simply a moose hide or cloth bag that laces up the front. It is not attached to a backboard and hence is not as large or cumbersome as the cradle board. The moss bag is so called from the old practice of filling it with absorbent moss, sphagnum fuscum, from bushland swamps. Infants raised in moss are never known to get diaper rash. The moss bags themselves originally were made from moose hide. Rarely, a half-breed child may have a little toy Tikkanogan. When we began our study of dislocation of the hip in the Indians of northern Saskatchewan, we thought that the Tikkanogan and the wasp bassoon were the only methods of swaddling. We soon discovered that this was not the case. All Indian babies are swaddled, even where the Tikkanogan and moss bag are no longer used. This hammock or swing is in very common use in Indian homes, 
And you can see that here the baby can flex its hips a bit, but is unable to abduct or externally rotate its thighs at all. This cloth around the hammock holds the baby securely. No pins were used here. This is certainly a very good way of keeping a little baby quiet and happy. Even when the Tikkanogan, the wasp bassoon, and the hammock are not used, if we watch an Indian mother bundle her baby, we will see that even the normal wrapping in blankets constitutes a very tight, restrictive form of swaddling. This was something of an eye-opener to us. Neither the anthropologists nor the medical profession have taken much interest in Indian swaddling, although, as I think you can see, there are a number of medical connotations to this practice. You will notice that many layers of diapers, flannelette sheets, and blankets are used, and even though this baby is not in a moss bag, it is just as tightly wrapped as it would be in one of the more formal methods of swaddling. Swaddling is part of the Indian's cultural heritage. It has evolved as the answer to the severe climate in which they live, their traditionally cold tents and shacks, and their nomadic habits. Although gradually there is improvement in their housing and general living conditions, swaddling persists. In spite of advice from nurses and doctors, the Indians continue to wrap up their infants. Of course, if these little babies are to be taken out on the trap line when it is 20 to 40 degrees below zero, they must be warm and this is one effective way of keeping them warm. The blankets you have seen so far would be the normal number for indoor use. If the baby is to be taken outdoors, a willow is formed into a hoop over the baby's neck and the end of the blanket placed over this and then a larger blanket placed over all. One wonders about the circulation of air beneath the blanket, but at least the rebreathed air will be warm. Note that the Indian mothers now wear ski pants in winter, just like the ladies in the more southern portions of Saskatchewan. To recapitulate the main message to this point, CDH must be diagnosed early, before the baby leaves the newborn nursery. Normal hips will then result from simple treatment. Some patients after late treatment are worse off than if they'd had no treatment at all. We have demonstrated to you the high incidence of CDH in groups practicing swaddling, in particular in the Indians of northern Saskatchewan. In contrast, congenital dislocation of the hip is virtually unknown among those people in the warmer climate where the babies are carried on the mother's back or astride the mother's hip. Shown here is our talented and attractive chief resident in radiology, carrying her five-month-old daughter in a back sling while she does her housework. Here the infant's legs are in marked abduction and external rotation, the very opposite of the tight swaddling in adduction used by the Indian. This is a very colorful sling. In Hong Kong, the only cases of CDH reported have been in babies raised in the Western style in a crib, babies who were not carried by this method on the mother's back. Even if the child had a genetic predisposition to CDH, or had generalized joint laxity, or had its hip ligaments stretched by the breech position in utero, and for any one of these reasons had a dislocatable hip at birth, this would be corrected by carriage in the back sling, since this is the treatment position for CDH. If begun soon after birth, this position would correct the dislocated hip just as would immobilization in a fracas splint or in a plaster cast. If the Indians could be persuaded to carry their babies in the Chinese fashion, as the Eskimo mothers do under their parkas, 
Presumably, even those with a dislocated or dislocatable hip at birth would be corrected, and CDH would then become as uncommon among Indians as it is among Eskimos and Chinese. When CDH is diagnosed early in infancy, surgery, anesthesia, and plaster casts are not required. All that is needed is an apparatus like this to hold the baby's legs in abduction and external rotation. Extra diapers may even suffice. In this position, the forces of the femoral head directed into the acetabulum cause the acetabulum to develop normally. Thus, early diagnosis and early simple treatment result in a perfectly normal hip that has no limp and no painful osteoarthritis in later life. The secret is early diagnosis. This is an example in an Indian child. This little girl was diagnosed early in life and treated early, and her hips developed normally. Even though she had a congenital dislocation of the left hip, which was treated at several months of age, her radiograph now shows a normal femoral head in a normal acetabulum on each side. There will be no complications. CDH is commoner in females among both Indians and whites, but otherwise the etiology of CDH in Indians is somewhat different from that of sporadic cases in the white population. There is a strong genetic factor often with a family history of CDH. Joint laxity is common. Swaddling is an important environmental factor in Indians, whereas breech delivery and increased frequency in firstborn are not important among Indians as they are in white populations. Untreated, complete dislocations have only a limp. Subluxations may develop painful osteoarthritis. Late treatment may convert a painless dislocation to a painful subluxation. With early diagnosis and treatment, normal hips result. All newborn infants should have their hips examined, particularly those infants with a family history of CDH or familial joint laxity, those born by breech delivery, and all Indians. Disability from CDH is now preventable.